Hey, good morning, Watermark Community Church. My name is John Elmore. I'm the teaching pastor. Did they say, uh, stop? What? We don't have. <laughs> stop! I think they must have put something on the back screen behind me that said, you all get a free $1,000. And everyone's like, thank you. Uh, man, I don't know if you know, but this past Thursday, AT&T had a little bit of a hiccup. You guys know about that? Any AT&T customers in the crowd? Dude, not to throw shade on a Dallas company, but I'm like, guys, you got one job. Like, that's, that's all you do. Like, you just connect us to our people. You've got to give us that signal. Uh, if you didn't know, AT&T went out. They said it was 70,000. I think that's a hair short. Uh, but I'm going through my day. I realized it, I realized it because I, I was reading on BBC News that morning on Thursday. And it's like, you know, outage by AT&T, thousands without cell coverage. I'm like, what? No, my, my phone works fine. I realized it was because I was on my home wireless still. As soon as I left the house, I'm like, what is wrong with Laura? Like, why was she not just right back? Missed call from TA, text, like things that I needed, like the activity that I had planned for the day came to a screeching halt. Why? Because I didn't have any connectivity to those relationships, like essential to that day. And then I'm driving, I remember I'm on Beltline and the signal came back. I mean, I've been checking it incessantly. All it says is like SOS. I'm like, yeah, it's just like, all I can talk to is a 911 operator. Like I need somebody more. And uh, I'm there on Beltline. And all of a sudden it's like, like all these texts start coming through. And the relief that I felt of like, oh, thank you. Four hours without cell phone. All I had is like a glorified calculator and an alarm clock on my phone. Like I, okay, like we can go now. Laura and I writing back and forth. I'm like able to carry on with my day. And I'm driving as I'm receiving these texts. And the thought came to my mind that stopped me. And it was hey, if your connection to the Lord was silent for four hours, would you have felt that level of anxiety? Would it have stopped your day as much if you didn't hear from the Lord for four hours, if you weren't in communication and contact with the Lord? Would it have had the same impact of what it did to me where I'm like, where, where, where is it? Has it come back online yet? Has it come, where's the signal? How come I can't get anything? That I'm not going through my day in those four hours being like, Lord, I haven't heard. Like, I need this decision. We don't know what to do here. We're waiting on you. I'm not going to move without you. I'm looking to you. I'm praying to you. I'm listening for the Spirit, looking for your providential fingerprints on things. And instead, it's just really not the case. But despite our unfaithfulness, God remains faithful because the ministry of the Spirit is not one that comes and goes, but we'll see today that he seals us as he indwells us. He leads us and sanctifies us and illuminates the word and the path, the will of God in us. That is the gift and presence of the Holy Spirit. And according by Romans chapter 8, as written by the Spirit through Paul, he says, nothing can separate you from the love of the Father. Nothing. That there is constant communication, whether we realize it or not, because of the indwelling of the Spirit. And so today, as we continue on in the series of Spirit-led church, the three things that we'll cover today. First, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Second, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. And third, the illumination of the Holy Spirit. Now, you need to hear this. Like, lean in. I promise you, I promise you, if you can personally appropriate these truths, you'll never be the same. Like, you will be changed. I'm looking out at Will right now and his dear bride, and I know them. And as they have been like, okay, those truths, they're not just true, they're true for me. He will change your life. I stand here as testifying to it. The word that you're going to see will reveal it. And so these three things, this is not just theology. This is something that will change your life. Special things for today. So first, indwelling of the Spirit. 
God has always dwelt with his people. He walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the garden. They walked with him. Then because of sin, there was a separation between mankind and God. But God still was like, I will dwell among you. Calls his people out of Egypt, give Moses the plan for the tabernacle. And he tabernacled with them in the wandering. And then as they came into the land. And then David, he gave David the plans, but he was too much of a man of war. And so there Solomon would make a temple for God. Very holiness, presence, glory of God dwelling there in the temple. Then 400 years of silence, then Jesus, cry of a baby, God in flesh, Emmanuel, God with us, Iesus, which means he saves. Fully God, fully man, walking amongst us for those years of ministry. Then Jesus utters these words. He said, it's better for you that I go, because if I go, I will send another, the helper. And so as proceeds from the Father and Son, the Holy Spirit comes. And at Pentecost, as they're staying in the upper room, praying and waiting, and Jesus says, wait until the Holy Spirit comes upon you, praying and waiting. It says that flames of fire lit upon them as they received the Holy Spirit and went out testifying to Jesus. And we live in that reality now. It says in Ephesians chapter one that whoever has placed their faith in Jesus, they have been sealed by the Holy Spirit in whom God dwells now, that you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. And then one day at the back of the book in Revelation 21 verse three, in a loud voice it says, behold, new heavens, new earth. Raised again, resurrection, glorified body. Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man. And he shall be their God. Where there is no tear, pain, nor sorrow. Full circle from the garden as they walked with him until now. And we live in this in-between with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. For that I want us to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. It will be on the screen. It's talking about sexual sin. And as a way to speak about sexual sin, God is like, I dwell within. You can't be in that sin as I dwell within. So he says this, or do you not know that your body, your physical body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. A temple, like when they heard that word, they would thought, I know exactly what a temple is for. A temple is a place of holiness and reverence. There's nothing profane there. There's nothing vain there. Like they would have called to their mind the temple that was there in Jerusalem that was only used for the worship of God. There was nothing profane ever to enter there. Holy of holies, glory of God. He's like, you are now that temple, your body, individually. And it says in Ephesians 2 that each of us individually is being built together to rise up as a temple to God. Not just you individually, but corporately, the universal church, temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. Having trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, the Spirit takes up residence forever in your body. It says you are not your own, for you were bought with a price, the very blood of Jesus Christ. So, therefore, the result, the action, is glorify God with your body. It's like you're a temple. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And so God's home in you does a lot as the Holy Spirit resides in us. I mean, this could be a sermon in and of itself, but he gives us new desires, a new will, a new heart. This is Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31, prophecies that were given hundreds and hundreds of years before the coming of the Holy Spirit. But he says, in those days, I will take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will write my laws upon you and move you to fulfill them. You see, the Pharisees and those, they were like, okay, here's the written law. We now will follow it letter by letter, line for line, command for command. And God is saying, hey, in the days to come, my spirit will be in you and moving you to follow my will. That's one of the blessings of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, new desires, new will. But not just that, the presence of God. It's Psalm 139, where can I flee from your presence? Now the Lord in us everywhere we go. God in you. Not just that, he brings about holiness in you. The Holy Spirit bringing about holiness in you. It says that he's our counselor. 
our comforter. 2 Corinthians 1, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions so that we might comfort others. He is the comforter. He is our helper. God helping us. God stooping low to be like, I'm here to help my children. He gives us conviction to know we are, when, when we are in and out of the will of God. You think about the Super Bowl, you know, that chalk line, the out of bounds line. As strong as those men are, not, that chalk line has no ability to keep them in or out of bounds. It simply shows them when they are out of bounds. That's the law of God. The law of God is good, holy, and right, but it doesn't have the ability to keep us in or out. It just shows us when we're out. Then the Holy Spirit, when we have stepped over the line of the law of God, is like, hey, this is not God's will. Come back and convicts us and compels us to move back to the will of God according to the law of God. He leads us. He as a person not an impersonal force, as some of the cults would say, but as a person leads us. When you read through Acts, you can't help but see this. With Philip the evangelist and others, there's an, there's an individual, providential, sovereign leading of the Holy Spirit. And he prays on our behalf and speaks to us. Now listen closely. The Holy Spirit is not mute It's not some impersonal force that lives within you and you're just kind of compelled along, but rather it says that he speaks to us and he prays on our behalf. Romans 8, it says we do not know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit prays on our behalf with groans too deep for understanding, for he knows the mind of God and knows what we need. It's incredible, strengthens our faith. We could go on and on and on and on about some of the gifts of the presence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But the one that we had here in the verse, it says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Therefore, honor God with your body. You were bought at a price. As I thought about this, I thought about our home, the Elmore household, in whom kids dwell. If God made his home in us, his children, I'm thinking about our house in which my kids dwell. And in that, I have like a zero tolerance for evil. So we don't watch scary movies. Not even like the silly ones that the the kids would watch that seem harmless, because I'm like, no, we don't, we don't deal in scary. Like, that's not of God, so we're not doing that. If, if the kids say, like, Alexa, play such and such song, there's certain ones where it just, like, won't happen. It's the Holy Spirit and Alexa that are like, nope, we don't play that song, because we've got a filter on it, because we're like, no, we're not, we're not having evil songs played there. Penny, we're at Walmart, like, picking out Earrings, like a 20-pack, and it's like sparkly ones, dangly ones, smiley faces. But then in the bottom right, she's like, what's that, Daddy? And I'm like, hey, we can't get this one. She's like, why? I'm like, well, that's a yin-yang. And a yin-yang is a religious symbol that means there's a little good and all evil. And in, in evil, there's a little good. It's a pagan symbol. We don't, we don't do that. And you might think, like, well, just buy it and throw it away. I'm like, no. I've got a zero tolerance for evil with my kids. It's instructive to them, and I want it out of my house. I don't want any evil in my house. But I think we tolerate evil in God's house. In our own lives, I think there is a certain threshold level of tolerance where it's like, what's, I mean, it's not that bad. I mean, everybody watches this show. We all binge watch, you know, that, even though we're laughing and mocking the sin that Christ died for, and maybe I'm doom scrolling, and that's become my idol at night. Like, that's how I numb out or escape or... You know, I mean, hey, drugs are, it's, it's legal in Oklahoma. And so, you know, even though God says be sober-minded, alcohol, food addiction, lack thereof, body image, status seeking, greed. I mean, there's like innumerable sins, but I think everybody's got something. Like 1 John 1, 1.8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. And so by way of application, I'm asking you right now is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit for those who have called on Jesus. What's become that place of tolerance of evil in God's house for you? Because we have to recognize it and turn from it. For me, I mean, I shared in the past recently, it's, it's, it was grumbling. Like, just like critical spirit grumbling. And then I came across 1 Corinthians 12, and he says that, that people drop dead in the desert because of grumbling when they came out of Egypt. I was like, wow, God takes that pretty seriously. But I had grown a tolerance for that evil in my life and so sought to repent from it. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
But it's not just the indwelling of the Holy Spirit where it's like, okay, so I get it. Like, I've got to be holy because he's holy, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be holy. I've got bad news for you, but i got good news. You can't. You have no ability to be holy. You're like, great, motivational speech. I have to be holy and I can't be holy? Awesome. This messed me up in my life. I would sin and sin and sin and I'd try harder and try harder and I was grieved by my sin. I knew it was wrong and I'd be like, oh Lord, that's the last time, last time ever. Not gonna do that again. And I'd do it again the next day, next week, whatever. I'm like, oh, I guess you're not the problem. I guess I am. Walked away from the whole thing. But God says, no, I not only indwell you, I make you holy. It's not just my presence. It is my purpose. And so the Holy Spirit, get this, When I talk about the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, it's that he makes you holy. It's the verb form of holy. In the Greek, sanctification, it's the verb holy, like he holies you. It's crazy. And so the the pneuma hagios, which is Holy Spirit, he hagiatsos you. He makes you holy of which you don't have the ability. Sin is a supernatural problem that demands a supernatural answer. And so the Spirit's like, just ask me, ask me. That's my job, that's my role. I will make you holy and I alone can. You can't do this on your own. And to be holy is to be set apart for God, separation only for Christ. And so the Holy Spirit will bear the fruit of the Spirit and he will kill the fruit of the flesh. Galatians 5.22. Somebody finish this for me. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Everybody's got that. We've all got that on lock. It's like the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And I'm reading John Owen, old Puritan theologian once, and he talks about that's, that's the positive work of the Spirit. And then I read and he says, and the negative work of the Spirit. I'm like, What? Negative work of the Spirit. Nothing the Spirit does can be negative. Why would he write that? This must be a wrong translation or something. He's like, well, the positive, the positive work of the Spirit is that he bears the fruit of the Spirit. The negative work of the Spirit is that he kills the fruit of the flesh. You don't have the ability to do that. That's him. He's the sin killer. And for that, it's Romans 8, 13. It says, if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. Meaning, if you do what you want to do, what your flesh wants to do, it's going to lead to death. In my case, alcoholism... It was leading to death. Porn will lead to death. Greed will lead to death. Self-image, body image will lead to death. All of it. It just all sin ends to death. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. He's like, just ask me. I am the sin killer. It's what I live to do. And so think about it this way. I'm going to give you two terms. One is positional sanctification. The other is progressive sanctification. Positional sanctification, Paul writes also to the Corinthian church. He's like, do not be deceived. The wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither is the sexually immoral, nor the adulterers, nor the swindlers, nor the drunkards, nor the homosexual offenders, um, nor the greedy. And I hit like many on that list. He's like, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you know what he also writes to the Corinthians? And he says, he says, such were some of you. But he also writes to the Corinthians, he says, he calls them saints, holy ones. He calls them saints, and then he gives them all of these like, and by the way, here's your sin struggles. And it's like, well, how can that be? That doesn't seem very saintly. It's like, you're saints because you belong to God. And because his spirit lives in you. Now, I know that you're doing unsaintly things, but you are saints. Positionally, you are saints. You're not sinners who sometimes saint, church. You are saints who sometimes sin. There's a huge difference. Like if you can grasp this reality about your identity, that you are a holy one of God, it'll change things. So that's positional sanctification. God saying like, you're saints. You're holy because you've trusted in Jesus and I live in you. Now I know you may do some unsaintly things as you sin, but positionally speaking, you are holy, set apart unto God, you're mine. But progressive sanctification means there is an ongoing change of us as the Lord shapes us into the image of Christ. By way of illustration, so I told you a while back that Dr. Abby Smith, pediatrician, she's amazing here at Watermark, 
She came home, well, she didn't come home. She gave us to take home a prescription. My kids, like, were waving in our face. They're like, Dad, I got a prescription. I'm like, oh, who's sick? The prescription says, uh, purchase the kids any puppy of their choosing. I was like, that is medical malpractice. <laughs> but we got a dog. Just recently. You'll see some pictures on the screen. This is Cash after the, the prodigal Johnny Cash. I oh, know. What, me or the dog? So uh, that's a golden doodle from Dustin Fleckinger. He and his wife, Callie, they, they raised these pups. They're, they're awesome. Um, so, hey, positionally, because he's my dog, no one's listening to a word I'm saying. You're just like, <laughs> he's my dog, so he's a good dog because he's mine. He's not some filthy, mangy, rabies, flea-ridden, you know, out there getting picked up by the dog catcher. Like, he's my dog, therefore he's good. Now, I'm here to tell you, he's not actually good all the time. Like he bites, he goes to the bathroom on our floor, which drives me crazy. Uh, chewed up hills like mouth guard for football. He does things that are not bad, that are, that are bad, that are not good. And yet I would say, cause he's mine, he's a good dog. I've chosen him. He belongs to me. Positional sanctification. And there is a progressive sanctification that he's becoming a better and better dog. He's not biting as much. Not because every day I walk out and I'm like, hey, cash, no biting, no going to the bathroom on the floor, see you at five. And he's like, got it. It's by him spending time with me and yielding to me that is making him a better and better dog into the one. So he's good because he's mine and he's becoming more and more like the dog that I've always longed for as he spends time with his master. The word Lord in Greek is kurios, it's master that we would spend time with him and he would bring about goodness in our life. It's just yielding to him and time with him through the spirit. So application, I would ask you, what is a struggle that you need the spirit to kill? Or what is a fruit that you need him to bear? So a struggle that you need him to kill, like, man, I keep going back to this thing and I know it's wrong and I can't do anything about it because I keep returning like a dog to its vomit. And he's like, I know, ask me, I'll kill that sin. Or what is a fruit that you need him to bear? Like maybe it's like, I need more patience in my life. I need more gentleness in my life. I need more self-control in my life. And he's like, thank you. Just walk with me and I will bear that fruit in you. That's my fruit. You can't generate that fruit. That's solely from me. Time with him, yielding to him. The spirit indwells us. The spirit sanctifies us. And thirdly, the spirit leads us by illuminating God's word and his will. So before Christ, the Holy Spirit had a role in all of our lives. If anyone identifies as a Christian, the Holy Spirit was at work in your life before you trusted in Jesus, and it was this. It says in John 16 that it's the Spirit's role to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now why those three? Those three work inextricably together. One of sin. The Spirit convicts us of sin. Then the Spirit reveals to us righteousness, the righteousness of God. I have sin, God is righteous. And third, of coming judgment. That because of that, I know that one day by the conviction of the Spirit, my sin has separated me from this righteous God. I will die and face judgment. And therefore, Jesus also says, the Spirit will glorify me. Then the Spirit removes the veil that we would behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and be like, he is my answer the antidote, the anti-venom of the indwelling sin that when I trust in Jesus will cross over from death to life because my sin, Christ's righteousness imputed to me having trusted in him and will never face judgment because of the gift of Jesus Christ. That's the Spirit's work, amen, in your life. Now, as a Christian, there's two things that the Spirit continues to do. One, the Spirit illuminates God's word. 1 Corinthians 2.13, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. That the Spirit, as we're reading the words of God, is teaching us. 
that he is actually teaching us. These are not just words on a page. These were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And as we're reading them, we listen for him. Why? Because he's teaching us. He, as a person, God in us, seeking to sanctify us as he indwells us, he's teaching if we're listening. See, it's very possible as a Christian to just do a cold read of Scripture, to do a Bible study per se. And I'm not, say, I'm not saying that Bible studies are wrong, but I think it may be a wrong name. Instead, it should be like Bible listening, that we're reading, but we're listening for the Spirit to teach us this living and active word by a living and active God, the Spirit living in us that he teaches us. It says right there, the Spirit teaching us. And so Bonhoeffer had a secret, sermon, a secret seminary during uh, fascist Germany. He took it underground, and he would tell his students, when you wake up, don't talk to anyone. Get your scriptures, pray, and then read. Read slowly and look for something to stand out. When it stands out, it's the Spirit calling to mind that particular word or phrase. And when you hear it or see it, stop. Stop and consider the word. Meditate on it. Ruminate on it. Ask the Spirit what he's seeking to reveal to you. So I do this when I read the Bible. It doesn't happen every single day, I think because of my heart and not his will. But this Friday, I'm, I'm sitting outside and I'm reading Acts chapter 9. And here's the problem. I'm really familiar with Acts chapter 9. I've diagrammed this in, sermon, in seminary. I've gone through it. I've been in, th in it through a part of a discipleship program, Bible reading program. Like I know what happens. Like, oh yeah, Saul, Saul trusted in Jesus. Um, scales on his eyes. He goes, Ananias lays his hand on him at a street called Straight. Scales fall from his eyes. He eats and drinks and is baptized. Then he goes about preaching boldly in the synagogues. Then he goes to the disciples and the disciples are like, no, we know who you are. You're a bounty hunter. You came here to trick us. You're going to drag us away. Like I know it all. And I'm reading in this passage and it's right here. It says, and when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him. I mean, they're like, oh, this is a ruse. This is a Trojan horse. Like, sure, yeah, you're a follower of Jesus. As soon as we open this door, you're going to, like, hogtie us and take us all. We know you have letters from the high priest to imprison us and even murder us. We know who you are. We know what you do. Nice try. Be gone. They were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And then the disciples took him in. As I'm reading this really familiar passage, visually, this is what happened to me spiritually on Friday. I'm reading, and there's like arrows this but Barnabas, the words but Barnabas are standing out to me. I'm like, I'm so familiar with this passage. I'm reading it. I'm going along and I'm like, Lord, what do you want to say to me today? And I get the but Barnabas and I'm like, that was it. It's just like this sense. You'd probably think, well, it's probably the Lord or Saul's conversion or whatever. Instead, it was but Barnabas. I'm like, what is it? Those words standing out to me. <laughs> and I feel like what the Lord was showing me is like, if it wasn't for Barnabas saying like, no, 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 God doesn't deal in past sins. He doesn't put you in timeout. doesn't make you pay penance. He doesn't deal in odds or probability. Like Barnabas was like, no, I've heard about him. He saw the Lord. He heard the Lord. He's been preaching in the synagogues. But Barnabas and Paul was brought into the church. And as I'm sitting there thinking about it, I'm like, well, what do you want me to learn and know? And, I, and it's but Charlie Parker, who was my AA sponsor, who took me in when I was zero days sober. And then but Chad Hampsh, when I was four months sober, who said, well, you can be a part of this year-long discipleship program. And but Scott Harrell, who was my theology professor, who had thousands of students, but put his arm particularly around me that I actually went over my sermon notes with for this morning two nights ago. And but Nate Graybill who took a gospel gamble on this former drunk. I was like, well, I'll, I'll make you the men's director of recovery almost 13 years ago. But Barnabas. And then as I thought about it, I feel like the Lord was like, who will you be but Barnabas for? Or will you just look for the ones who were all cleaned up, but will you still believe that there is gospel 
in people no matter what the sin and will you be a but Barnabas for the person who's just come to the faith out of all of this trouble? Will you care for them, love them, and shepherd them? And then the Spirit illuminates God's will. Romans 8, 14, it says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons, daughters of God. The mind set in accordance with the Spirit is life and peace. But those who are children of God are led by the Spirit of God. Page 62 of the AA Big Book, it says that our problem actually wasn't alcohol. It's self-will run riot. That we think we can control ourselves and everybody else. And I think we slip into that. That's what the, the Pharisees were guilty of. They're like, well, we know the commands of God, and so we'll just operate according to him. And he's like, no, you can't do this apart from me. The Christian life is not an autonomous one where we're like, okay, read the word, do what it says. Read the word, do what it says. And that may sound like heresy. Like, wait, that is what we're supposed to do. It's actually, there's so much more. The Pharisees were trying to read what it said and do what it says. They were doing that. And Jesus is like, hey, you search the scriptures in search of me, and they, bold, they proclaim me throughout. You're missing it. This is a relationship, not just you following in, in religious duty. And so it's not read and do. It's read and then plead with God to lead you to do what it says. That we would never be like, yep, yep, yep. Okay, cool. Got it. But instead it's reading it, knowing that doesn't, that doesn't supernaturally dwell within me. So pleading with God to lead you according to his will. And so the application here to pray before you read, before you open this book, the only holy book, and say, Spirit of God, would you speak to me? Call to mind whatever it is that you want to teach me today so that we would hear and be led by him and then also in his life, that's the illumination of his word, but also the illumination of his will that we would be so interruptible in this life by the Spirit that it would be like, are you moving me to talk to him? That we would see interruptions as divine interruptions, coworker maybe, someone in need. Is there any way that I could pray for you? Have I ever told you my story? Could I hear your story? That we would be interruptible by the Spirit to lead us into his will in all things. The indwelling of the Spirit, the sanctification of the Spirit, the illumination of the Spirit. So when AT&T came back on, like the relief that came because I could communicate again was huge. And in the scriptures, we're told to keep in step with the spirit. That it's not just a quiet time and then we go about our day and we're like, well, I'll pray before meals and again before bed. But rather it's all day, every day, this keeping in step with the spirit as he lives and moves through us according to his will. Now, church family, Speaking of desiring to be spirit-led, and I'm going to be looking down at my notes uh, more now. We as the Elmore family have an update to share with you, our family in Christ, and just shared this with the nine o'clock as well. We love this church so much. There is a dream team here on a dream mission. I've got a dream boss in David Zena. You all are a dream to serve and lead with, and we dreamed that we would always be here. Laura has joked often, hey, bury me in the backyard. Like, this is it. I'm not going anywhere. And yet she has also said that in the Christian life, we don't get the luxury of writing in pen. God has us write in pencil. And so in November, when I learned that my job was changing, to be completely authentic and vulnerable, that was hard. And it hurt. But the week thereafter, met with all of the elders, we sat down and through prayer and tears and love and forgiveness, we are whole. And that was in November. There's nothing lingering, fully resolved. And in that time also, they invited me very graciously, hey, we want you to, we're changing the model, but we want you to dream about what you would do next. We want you to be here for decades to come. And so take time and space to dream about what role you would like to do. And in that moment, like we stepped back, we felt like we were at a crossroads Always at Watermark, I've just kind of fallen to the next position, but this one felt unique and different in kind. We're like, hey, we need to like really step back and consider who has God called me to be? What are the core giftings that he's given me? And where we arrived is that we, we feel like he has called me to pastor, preach, and lead, that he's made me to be a pastor. The elders all affirmed that. And so as such, I presented some roles, and then they presented some roles. 
But in the midst of evaluating those and thinking about them, while we desire and desired to stay at Watermark, we had this superseding and surpassing desire that we wanted to follow God in all things, that we wanted to be spirit-led, that we're not the ones to call the shots, but that God is. And we determined that we would choose calling over comfort because our, we wanted this to be our always. And we decided also that there would be no pros and cons list. It wasn't gonna be by logic or rationale or preference, but that we were gonna pray, seek counsel, and wait on the Lord. Just simply pray, Lord, lead us. Lead us. And in that time, without seeking, three other churches began conversations with us about pastoring roles. And so we sought God. We now had four different things on the table. It was very confusing and overwhelming. And so we're like, all right, God, what do you want us to do? We love this church and yet these three others. And so what is it you're asking of us? And we were met with silence, which actually was incredibly hard and frustrating. Like, what are you doing? Why are you silent? Of all the times to be silent, this is not the one that we would choose. But we say that God seems really slow until he doesn't. And when he moved, he moved quickly. He moved unmistakably. He moved undeniably. And he began showing us. We were pleading for God for clarity, and he's given it to us. I think about a connect the dots picture like kids would use. Like when there's three dots, you're like, I don't know, it could be like the top of a tree, it could be a part of a car, that could be a wheel. I can't tell what that is, but with an increasing number of dots, you begin to see the picture. And that's as we waited, there was silence and then it was just like dots through a dream, through signs, through a knowing. Laura would tell you she knew she had breast cancer before she had breast cancer. She walked out of the bathroom and was like, I know that God just told me I have breast cancer. I'm like, you're 36, what are you talking about? She knew, sure enough, she did. And with this decision, I remember I came into the bedroom one night and she said, I know what we're supposed to do. I sense it from the Lord. And I was like, I don't know. Like, we're still in conversations. She's like, I just know it. She knew it before me, so much so that she said, John, if we don't do this, we're in disobedience. And so in faith and fear of the Lord, we're moving to Waco to serve alongside Jonathan Pecluda, JP, former campus pastor, teaching pastor here at Harris Creek, to help lead and care for the staff and pastor the flock and preach, full deployment of my giftings. A year and a half ago, we were at this young adult conference with Laura, Monica, JP, and we're talking and I'm, I'm, I'm always asking him, I mean, there's some of our closest friends. I'm like, how's the church? How are the elders? How's the staff? How's the body? And he's like, yeah, yeah, good, good, good. He's like, you know, we lack something on our staff. And I, I thought for a while it was like kind of ex executive pastor wiring. I think I actually need more of a number one wiring, like somebody else who's got leadership, pastoral, um, preaching gifts. And that's been a rock in my shoe ever since. And so we, we prayed. I mean, as recent as this past summer, we were praying like, Lord, what would you have for us with that rock in the shoe? And yet, like in October, I remember we were in the kitchen, Laura and I, and we, we heard wait very distinctively, independently from each other. Within 12 hours, we were praying. I, she like came downstairs and I was like, I think I just heard wait regarding this conversation with JP. And she's like, I just did too. And so we like dropped it. We're like, okay, Lord, you say wait, we're waiting. And there was peace in that. There was peace in that wait. And then I was doing a region leader's funeral, Larry Crop, up in the chapel. And I remember I called JP afterwards. I was like, I can't do this. I can't, I can't even have this conversation. I love these people too much. But then God continued to move, undeniably leading us as we have sought to be spirit-led. And so at this point in time, I wanna invite my family up. These are my kids. You've heard me talk about them a lot. This is... Uh... <clears throat> so this first young man, this is Judd. You heard about him shooting out my window. <laughs> and uh, the next one, this is Hill. He just turned 10 yesterday. And you've heard me talk about him and his faith. And then here's Penny Jane. She's the one that got the hamster who's made it in some illustrations. And of course, my wife, Laura. And so if you guys would stand over here, we wanted to thank you all publicly for this because as we follow the Lord in faith, our words fail us for our love for you. Laura was on staff for five years, me for almost 13. 
And no part of this transition is any kind of commentary on Watermark. No part of this, hear me, is we're hurt, we're leaving. This is not me taking my ball and going home. This is God calling us to a new role to do what God has made me to do. And frankly, we are more excited than ever for Watermark in this new direction, the prayer and fasting, the worship nights. I mean, I've heard from all of you, and we are so behind the leadership in this direction. And we grieve the leaving, you specifically, the body. As I look out and see names and faces of people that I love, we grieve leaving you, and yet are excited also for what God is calling us to. And both can be true and are. It's heartbreaking, and at the same time, like heart-pounding anticipation as we walk into what's next with this exceedingly clear calling. And I'm so proud of these three and my bride as they're stepping in faith. It's one thing for me to be called, another for them, especially in their young faith, with not a whole lot of Ebenezer's to say like, yeah, I've seen the Lord thus far, to say, okay. Then we go too, and they go in faith. And my dear wife, with this step of faith, and saying that she knew also. And so with your investment in us as a family, me as a staff member, you entrusting all these years to us, frankly, our livelihood has been because of your generous giving. We thank you. We thank you, and that falls woefully short. And so we want to bless you for your investment in our lives, your co-laboring in Christ, and may the Lord lead us all. Thank you so much. No, I think you stay up here. Oh, you can go ahead. You can go ahead. Hey, Laura. I don't know. You see, I, I think it'd probably be too long. They're all being giggly. It is, um, uh, you are, uh, you're hearing applause from people uh, that are so incredibly grateful for the gift that you've been to them. Uh, and it is uh, a sweet gift that for many people in this room, uh, they know you, John, on Sunday mornings. Uh, but I get to know you and your bride as dear friends. Uh, and so things that that you're hearing in applause, uh, I'd like to attempt just in a few words to, to say out loud to you. Oh, goodness, brother. Uh, when I think of you, man, I think of a man of courage, a man of incredible kindness. Uh, you are a pastor of God's flock. You are a lover of people. You are a man that runs to the fire. You are a man that... Um, that has walked with me through moments of trial and difficulty, love me and my family. You love my kids. I know them by name. And you, um, you've been such a gift to us, such a gift to us. And so we just wanna say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness, brother. Thank you, Laura, for your faithfulness. You are an amazing woman, man. When I, when I heard you coming to your man and you sharing with him your conviction to follow God's calling, even when it's scary and hard, um, I just marvel at that. I go, what an amazing, amazing woman that is partnered with my brother that I love so much. And so thank you. Thank you, sweet sister, for the way that you are one with him in the way that he would not be the man and the pastor that he is apart from your love and your support. And John, thank you, brother. And your efforts here and your labors here with us, they will last many, many years beyond your time on this team. And we rejoice, brother, that our partnership in the gospel, it does not end here, not at all. But 
we all serve at the pleasure of the king, don't we? And we get to follow him where he leads. And so as elders, we rejoice with you. We affirm with you God's call. And we celebrate that above comfort and above ease or familiarity, that you're following where he's leading. And he has good and great things. And the gift that Harris Creek is getting in the both of you uh, is just going to be uh, like a gift that they get to unwrap. They don't even know what they're receiving. And it's the Lord's kindness to them, just as you have been the Lord's kindness to us. So thank you. you. Rob? Yeah, I just want to add to, to what Ben said just so well, John and Laura, we love you. And I'm just, just even hearing the response to, to you when you got up on stage, it just, I, I, I want to speak honestly for the room and just say, first, we're really thankful and excited for what's happening here. Uh, this is what God's doing, and we believe it. And we're so grateful for you. And, and, there's, a, and there's, a, uh, there's a pain in this, too, for us, because we're going to miss you guys. You guys have made such an impact. John, the way that you preach the gospel, the way that you've led us uh, just to Scripture, the way you've testified with your story. If you've heard two sermons from this man, you know his story, and, and you tell it so well, and you make such an impact when you do. And so we're so thankful. And we just have to almost remind ourselves that, you know, one of the marks of Watermark is we want to be a sending church. And that can happen in, in a lot of ways. But essentially, it means there are some that are here that eventually go there. And for you to be able to be here in the way that you've made an impact and to go somewhere else and to make that kind of impact, man, God gets the glory for that. And so we're so thankful. We want to pray for John, but before we do that, we actually have a dear, dear friend of ours that made a video message, and he'd like to speak to you right now. Hey, friends, my name is JP or Jonathan Precluda, and I have been incredibly blessed by Watermark Community Church. Not only did I get to serve there as one of the pastors on staff, I also became a Christian there about 20 years ago, and so I am incredibly indebted to you. But my latest expression of gratitude is to you for sharing uh, John Elmore with us at Harris Creek. And so five years ago, our family moved to Waco, Texas to pastor a church there. And we are an extension of your ministry. We are an extension of your investment. And I have been searching the world really to try to find someone to help me lead the body there. And as, as Monica and I have prayed and we talked with some of our closest friends in the entire world, the Elmores, uh, God has made it abundantly clear that they are the ones to fill that need. And so I'm so excited to be working with John and closely, and I know that he leaves a void there. I know that you guys love him so much. And so I asked the elders if I could just film this video as an expression of gratitude to you for sharing him with us. And so I am so encouraged by all that God is doing there. Uh, I love Timothy Atik, TA, so much. I love watching God move through him and my dear friend Blake Holmes and all the elders there. They've been incredible in this conversation. As soon as John and I thought that this might even be a possibility, uh, he looped in the elders. I had a conversation with the elders there and they gave us their blessing. And so I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Please pray for us. Please pray, pray for the Elmores in this transition. Pray for Harris Creek in this transition. And just know that I'm incredibly grateful for your generosity to us. I love you guys so much. Thank you for all that you've done to bless our church in Waco, Texas. Hey, one of the markers that we've talked about is we've just said we want to be a unifying church, which just means we want to be about what God is doing, not just here, but all over the nation in other churches. And so what I love is, hey, we will partner together with John and JP for many years to come. I love that Harris Creek feels like an extension of Watermark, and Watermark feels like an extension of Harris Creek, and so we, I, I love that we'll get to partner together for a long time. Um, 
Let me just ask you, I'm going to put an email on the screen. It's John Elmore email. And uh, I don't, we, we put email in there so you know, this is an email address, but John Elmore email. John Elmore was taken. John Elmore was taken by you? Anyway. Uh, <laughs> hey, don't assume that John knows how God has used him in your life. Tell him, okay? Take that email, that is an opportunity just for you to express to him how God has used him in your life. And so I would strongly encourage you, just don't miss an opportunity to thank John for his investment in you. And then here's, here's what I know, is John has personally prayed for thousands of you. And so this is an opportunity for John and Laura to be prayed for by you. And so I just wanna ask you, even right now, like if you're with someone, you can turn toward them, and I want y'all to pray out loud for the Elmores. If you're here by yourself and you feel comfortable, pray out loud, and let's allow the Elmores to hear us as a church family gathering around them and praying to God for them. So let's just take a moment and let's pray, pray out loud, pray together for the Elmores, and then uh, we'll go from there. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the man that is John Elmore. We thank you for the work that you have done in his life. As he is yielded to you, he is, um, he's one of those people who can say with confidence, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, he's modeled that in our lives. Uh, he has ministered to us. He has loved us in the midst of uh, toughness. Uh, we have seen um, a picture of what it means to yield to you and your spirit through John. And we celebrate that, and we know that that is all you. Father, uh, just this morning, uh, the verse that you have impressed upon my heart is, uh, uh, the Lord has done this, it is marvelous in our sight. We thank you, Lord, even though we don't fully understand all that you do. We know that you are good and that your plans are better than ours. Uh, and we yield to your will. Thank you, Father, for, um, for the Elmore family. We pray that you will bless every aspect of this move. And uh, we love what you're going to do in Harris Creek through John and Laura. Yes, Lord, I do thank you for this man of God and his godly wife. I just thank you for the role of John in my life, Lord, just helping me understand how to pray, helping me understand how to trust you more radically, and uh, just to live out our faith in all the various ways that you call us to. I thank you for the, just a the picture of the gospel that we have in John Elmore and how you take us and draw us to yourself and write an amazing story that has nothing to do with ourselves but glorifies you. I pray um, that you will continue to lead them uh, pray that you'll continue to make their path straight, Lord, throughout the transition, that you will, you will, through all of this, draw John and Laura closer to you. And as a result, draw them closer to each other 
Lord. And I pray for the days ahead in this new season, all that you have for them. And I thank you for all the days that we've had together here in Dallas, here at Watermark. And just rejoice that those days aren't over, Lord. I do pray for Harris Creek that you will just continue to give JP and those wisdom and those elders and John wisdom as they lead that body. And I pray for just more opportunities for us to serve together, to worship you together, uh, anticipating the days that we get to worship you together for eternity. So thank you for John. Thank you for your spirit, how you've led through all of this. Thank you for your love and thank you for Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing the doxology. We're going to sing the So, church, if, if, I, if we can make it through, I think it's a, just a, a good and right thing for us to do to praise the God from whom all blessings flow and sing that doxology together. So will you join me in singing the Lord, singing to the Lord? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's sing that again together. Sing praise God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above. There's a lot of benedictions throughout the New Testament and in the Old. And Lauren and I looked over about 20 of them to try to find one that fit this in this season. There's a first portion that I want to say to Harris Creek, if anyone's listening in from there, and the second, the balance of it for Watermark, if you would, please bow your heads. To Harris Creek, and may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and to Watermark. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. Lord, lead us all. Have a great week of worship. We love you.